Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for bringing revelation. Thank you that we'll take hold of it and we'll be doers of it. We'll see the fruit of it in our life. Praise you for all that you're accomplishing through it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of conquering. So important. You and I must conquer, and we've talked about many areas where you and I are to conquer. Well, today we're going to be talking about, we've been talking about the members, talked about our ears, what we're hearing, we talked about what we're seeing, and now we're going to talk about that little member, that tongue, our words of our mouth, which is so important, to learn to conquer the words of your mouth and put them in operation to see God accomplish what He purposes for you. Revelation 21, verse 7. He that overcometh, if you're here for the first time, we bring up information we describe on the screen, in the lower window. This is a word that means conquer and carry off the victory. And it's not just once in a while. It is continual because this is a present tense verb. The tense voice and mood are extremely important to understand what's being said. Present tense means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. Meaning, this is saying that he who is conquering and carrying off the victory continually inherit all things. Well, God would never tell us this if he didn't expect us to conquer and carry off the victory and enable us to do so. And we can. When you do so, you will inherit all things. I will be his God and he shall be my son. We're going to talk about the words of your mouth. Now we see first off in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Speaking of Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. How did Jesus function? He was upholding all things by the word. The word for, here for word, there's a couple different words in the Greek for word. One of them is logos, which is just the general one for word. This is the word rhema which speaks of that which is spoken, something that is spoken. So this is talking about the spoken word of his power. The word power is the word dunamis, which means power. And when it says upholding, this also has the understanding of bringing things forth. It is translated bring or to bring forth these majority of times, this particular word throughout the New Testament. So this is speaking of he's upholding and bringing forth all things by the spoken word of his power. The power of God is in the word. And you are now to get that word in your heart and it's also to be in your mouth so that you speak it forth. As you speak it forth, you will bring forth all things by the spoken word of his power. That means that your mouth is to be a releaser, a releaser of the power of God when the word is on the inside of you. We see over in Deuteronomy also another aspect of regarding this here about this word in our heart, in our mind. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 14 says, The word, this one, <coughs> this speech, this word that you speak, is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart. So it's to be in both places. It gets in your heart as you hear it. It gets written in your heart. It's also to be in your mouth as you speak it. That thou mayest do it. Notice. This is all tied into you being a doer of it because you're keeping it before you. If it's in your heart and you're keeping it in your mouth, then you'll keep your mind on it, paying attention to it, and you will be a doer of it. We see over in Romans that this quote from this, but a little bit different as Paul speaks some things that are important. Romans chapter 10, verse 8. He says, what saith it? The word, this again is the word rhema, the spoken word is nigh you, even in your mouth and in your heart, that's where it is to be, gets written in your heart, and then it's in your mouth to speak forth to release the power of God. That is the spoken word of faith which we preach. This is the spoken word that is going to bring things into being, and it's with your faith. Now verse 9 goes on and says that if you shall confess, and when it speaks here, it shall confess, this is actually a subjunctive mood verb, which means it's a conditional statement. If you might confess would be the way you translate. It's not a future tense. It's if you might confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus 
and if you might believe, same thing, subjunctive mu, which is a conditional statement of the Greek, in thine heart that God has raised them from the dead. And when it talks about the dead, by the way, this is not talking about just out of physical death. The reason being is because this particular word for talks about dead. This is the word dead, necros, and it's plural. So it's talking about, and it's an adjective. So it's talking about the dead ones. Where were all the dead ones? Down in hell, when Jesus was down in hell. When did he get raised out of the d dead ones? When he got born from above, he was the firstborn from spiritual death to spiritual life. And so if you believe that he, having accomplished the redemption, then brought forth the reconciliation by spiritual birth, being born from spiritual death to spiritual life, getting a new spirit, being a firstborn, you shall be saved because that's what's of a necessity because you're going to receive him and become a firstborn as well when you get a brand new spirit having received Jesus. Now, he goes on, he says, you shall be saved. Now, when it speaks about shall be saved, this is future tense and passive voice, meaning who's going to accomplish it. God does it because you can't make yourself be saved. Passive voice means the subject, which is you and I, is being acted upon by somebody else. So that's God doing this. Now, does this mean now that if I do this, that the one saved always saved? As some people believe, no, because it goes on and says, for with the heart, man is be, has come to believe continually, present tense, so it's continually, but it's a passive voice, so it's not talking about him doing it all by himself. He has come to be believing continually because of the word that God has brought in and brought revelation to him unto righteousness. You aren't going to be able to figure anything out yourself. It's all by revelation. And with the mouth, confession is being made as you're speaking this same thing ongoingly Passive voice, God's work through the word in you that is bringing forth that as you speak it. This is what he's bringing forth into being unto salvation. Well, this shows the fact that I need to be continually believing the word unto righteous. And I need to be continually speaking forth what his word says, confessing, in order to produce the salvation of the Lord, showing it's an ongoing work because it's present tense. And it's done by God's work in your life because it's a passive voice in each case. That is important to realize. Matthew chapter 12. Your words are important, and we must make sure that our words are speaking right things. Matthew 12, verse 34. He says, O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Whatever is in your heart is going to come out of your mouth. That's why you need to guard your heart and you can't let an evil thing come into your heart. You've got to make sure you're only getting the word into your heart. You want only the word in you, so then that'll come out of you. He says, a good man out of the good treasure. The word treasure is actually this word, the Greek word thesaros, where we get our English word thesaurus, which is a collection of meanings of words. So this is talking about out of the good collection or as it indicates here, the good collection of the heart. But what are we collecting in our heart? The word, not anything else, brings forth good things. But an evil man out of the evil collection, that's why you got to make sure you're not taking anything evil into you. And how does it get into your heart? Through all the gates, all your members, through what you hear, what you see, what you speak, what you walk after. You got to guard yourself. You're supposed to guard your heart with all diligence. Because out of it flows the issues of life or the goings of outgoings of life. So evil man, if he's got the evil things in him, he's going to be bringing forth evil things. Well, why are all these people speaking evil things? Because they got an evil deposit. They've been collecting evil things. And even Christians shouldn't be collecting any evil things into their heart. We need to make sure that we're guarding our heart. Now, how can that happen? Not only from what you hear, but also through what you speak. Because your words not only are heard outside, but they're heard on the inside as well. They're affecting you within. Look what he says. I say unto you that every idle word, and the word is for rhema, spoken word. Idle refers to that which is 
free from labor, shunning labor. It's not performing what it ought to be performing. If you look it up in Freiburg's lexicon, it means it's inactive and not working. Every non-productive, not working, wor spoken word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof, not in the day of judgment. The reason we say that is because this is talking about in a day of judgment. There's no definite article here between. So what does that tell you? It's not talking about the very end. It's talking about a day of judgment. When would that be? Anytime you're speaking the wrong word, now you're, 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 you're going to get some judgment coming at some point in time in your life now. Judgments after judgments after judgments will come. You wonder why are all these destructive things happening? Well, have you been maybe speaking some wrong things or speaking non-productive things or words that are not producing? God expects you to use your mouth to speak right words. Your mouth is a releaser. It is to release the right things. We must speak right words. You're going to give account in a day of judgment. Otherwise, you're, and when it talks about giving account in a day of judgment, this is when you're going to see a judgment rendered against you in some capacity. And it will happen. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, or this means rendered righteous or declared righteous, shown to be righteous. But also by thy words you shall be condemned or judgment will be against you because the Greek word actually kata dekazo refers to against righteousness. You're against that which is righteous. And what's going to happen? You're going to get judged. If you're doing unrighteousness, which is sin, you're going to be bringing judgment upon yourself at some point. Not at the end of your life. It's going to be, it can happen continually, ongoingly. That's why we've got to learn to speak right words. That is so important. We come to Psalms 50. In Psalms 50, we see a statement made that is, reveals something. In verse 16, he says, Unto the wicked, and who are the wicked? The wicked are the ones who are guilty of sin. It's really the opposite of those who are righteous. So it's talking about someone who's unrighteous, who's walking in sin. The wicked, the one who's walking in sin, God says, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in, your, in thy mouth? What, what kind of a statement is that? You mean I can take his covenant in my mouth? That's right. When you have the word in your mouth, you can speak those covenant promises into being. If you're in sin, can you take his covenant in your mouth and think it's going to produce anything? No, it's not going to do anything because you're not right with God. You have to be right with God if you're going to see that your things you speak to bring bringing in to manifestation covenant promises. But this is very revealing that you are to take the covenant in your mouth by speaking the promises that have been given unto you. All the promises of God are yea and in him in. Remember that we've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And you are to speak those words. You are to pray the word, remember. You pray the word of God, which is taking the covenant promises that you're going to speak them into being and take hold of them to see them come to pass in your life. Now, we also see another thing. <clears throat> John chapter 6, verse 63. It's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profits nothing. The words, spoken words, rhema, that I'm speaking unto you, their spirit and their life. That means all these words he's spoken to us, their spirit and their, because it's all, everything is now a spirit in the New Testament, because we now have come into the relationship with him in spirit as we are born from above, getting a brand new spirit and their life. They will produce the life of God, the Zoe life of God in us. Now, so you're going to speak these things to bring it into manifestation. And what are you doing? Remember, it's talked about the spoken word of faith. Well, well how does that come into play here? Well, you've got to understand when you've got a brand new spirit, you also got a spirit of faith. 2 Corinthians 4.13, we having the same spirit of faith. Well, what does that tell you right off the bat? That means everybody who's born from above 
has a spirit of faith, and it's the same spirit of faith because we all have the same spirit of Christ. According to as it's written, I believe and therefore have I spoken. That was declared back in the Old Testament. Then it now tells us what we do in the New Testament. This is all past tense. But now this is talking about what we do to put our faith in operation in the New Testament, which is present tense, ongoing. We also believe continually because a present tense ongoingly. And therefore we speak. Same thing, present tense ongoingly. So we're going to believe continually and we're going to speak continually. That's how your faith is put into operation as you are speaking continually the Word of God to bring things into being. Now Philippians or Philemon uh, verse 6 tells us something that's important for us to understand. It says that the communication, and this is the word koinonia, which not many times means fellowship or association, or, but also refers to participation or joint participation. So the joint participation of your faith, which you and I have the spirit of faith and we're to put it in operation, may become, this is, again, a conditional statement because it's a subjunctive mood. Subjunctive mood means a conditional statement. Conditions have to be met for it to happen may become, if conditions are met, active. This is the word energes, meaning active and operative and effective, in or by the precise, correct knowledge of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now, it says acknowledging. It makes you think it's like a participle with the ing on the end, but it's not. It's a noun. And so it shouldn't be translated that way. It's a mistake. Here's the word. And it is a noun, not a participle. Therefore, the way you would translate it is, it become, may become actively working in or by the precise, correct knowledge of every good thing which is in you. And it's interesting what it says after that. This is the word in, E-N. These prepositions are important to see what's said. In you. And then the next statement, it doesn't say en again, talking about you being in Christ. It said, instead it uses the word ice, which means into. And this is the preposition that refers to motion into something. So what it's saying is, you're going to be, particip particip participation of your faith may become actively effectual and operative in the precise, correct knowledge, you've got to get it exactly, of every good thing that's in you, which is all that's been given to you, all the promises, into Christ Jesus, meaning you are coming into becoming like Christ Jesus if you are putting your faith into participation effectively, meeting the conditions, according to the precise, correct knowledge of God, speaking those things into being, because you are becoming a participant or a partaker of something. It's of your faith. And what is that going to produce? It's going to bring you into the likeness of Jesus, that you become like Him. This is why it says, into Christ Jesus. We see the same thing brought forth over in 2 Peter 1.4. It's similar. Whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises. We have all these promises. That bought through these, literally this says, you might become, same word, ginomai, might become, conditional statement just as well, Partakers, the word, koin, not the koinonia, that, that's the verb form, this is the noun form, koinonos, meaning referring to a partaker, you might become a partaker of the divine nature. Well, what's that mean? I'm going to become like him. That's why the other said, into Christ Jesus. You're becoming like Jesus as you possess the promises of God. And what Philemon's talking about is the participation of your faith will become active of everything that's in you in Christ Jesus, all the promises that have been given that are in you, into becoming like Him as you are partaking these, these, these great exceeding promises. You're becoming a partaker of the divine nature as you possess them. Meaning, as you possess the promises of God, you're becoming like Jesus, essentially. And it's going to happen because of the participation of your faith actively in operation to see the promises come to pass. But it's got to be according to precise, correct knowledge.
And of course, as you get the, and you, what are you going to do? You're going to be speaking these things into being as you take hold of the promises of God by the participation of your faith, as it said. This is why you got to understand you need God's Word in your mouth and in your heart and speaking it forth to put God in operation. Look at what it says back here in Exodus 4.15. He says, Thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth. What words would they be? God's words. And I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what you shall do. Meaning when the words of God are in your mouth, he's going to be with your mouth. Is he with your mouth if you're not speaking the words of God? No. You're just speaking what you want. You could have speaking all kind of idle, non-productive words. You need to have God's word in your mouth. He will be with you when his words are in your mouth. That's why we got to get the words in us. And furthermore, when you speak by the words in your mouth, you are also seeing the Holy Spirit operating as he is a performer of the word as you speak it forth. We see this shown forth in the principle here in 2 Samuel 23, 2. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me. Oh, well, how did he speak by you? His word was in my tongue. So when the word is in you and you're speaking it out with your tongue, the Spirit of the Lord will be speaking by you to accomplish and bring these things into being because the Holy Spirit is a performer of the word. He will see these things come to pass. So from all this we can see, our spoken words are extremely important. What you speak, you're, if you're not speaking right words, you're going to see a judgment. If you are speaking right words, you're putting your faith in operation. If you're speaking right words and putting your faith in operation, possessing promises, then you're, going to, you're actually going to come into Christ Jesus, become a partaker of the divine nature, change into the very image of Him, possess all the promises in your life, and see the tremendous work of God accomplished. So we must understand about words. Words are important. In fact, we even go back to Genesis chapter 1. When God begins to bring things into being, notice what it says throughout Genesis 1. Genesis 1, verse 3, God said, He said words, let there be light, and there was light. Or literally, literally light be, and light was. He spoke words, and it brought it into manifestation. And if you go through all of Genesis, you'll see the same thing happen time and time again. God said, God said, God said, God said. It keeps on saying that. Why? Because it's trying to show you every time God speaks, that's how he brings something into being. It will be the same thing for you and me. You're going to have to speak to bring things into being. And every time you speak the right words, you're going to be releasing the power of God in the spoken words to bring those promises into being. Words are carriers and they release what's in them. Well, that means you've got to be speaking right things. If you speak wrong things, you could be releasing negative things. You don't want to speak words of doubt. You don't want to speak words of, of hatred. You don't want to speak words that are contrary to what is in line with the Word of God. That's a mistake. Words are also, we saw that the spoken words, Jesus said, they, are, they produce life. They're living and they're active. In fact, we can even see this in the New Testament over in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The Word of God is alive, it's living, and active, not powerful. It's the word active, energes, if you notice below. It's active. So when it's, it's a living and active, and how's it put into, uh, put, uh, this living word put into active operation? When you're putting your faith in operation. It's sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing or penetrating it can penetrate through to everything, whether soul, spirit, joints and marrow, the center of the thoughts and tents of the heart. God's word is penetrating into everything and will determine, discern everything. This is why we must understand this word is alive and it is active when you put it in operation. It's not automatic. The words on the page aren't doing anything. The words, even if you just know them without speaking them, they're not, they're not going to be releasing things into being. Your mouth is a releaser. That is so important. And what do they release? What's contained in them. They're not just sounds. They're releasing something. They're putting something in operation. In fact, we can even see back in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, literally what it says. Through faith, we understand 
that the not worlds, this is the word aeon, which means the ages, it's plural, the ages, and there were all different ages that were, have come forth. The ages were framed or here put in order by the spoken word of God. Otherwise, the spoken word of God brought all these things into being. Everything was spoken from the spiritual words of God that brought everything in the natural into manifestation. So that the things which are seen, everything in the natural, were not made of things which do appear. Well, they, that means they became into being, literally, by things which do not appear, which is spiritual words. Well, the same principle is going to work with you. You're going to speak God's words that are spirit and life to bring things into being to manifest in your life as you speak the word of God. You're releasing the power in that word and that's how you bring things from the spiritual realm into the natural realm into manifestation in your life. You're going to learn to speak right words. As you speak right words, God is going to be performing those words Look at the scripture in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 19. Here he says, I create, or more literally, this means producing here. It's a participle. I am producing the fruit of the lips. So the fruit of your lips, of course, if they're speaking right things, are going to be producing the things that are contained within them. You're going to speak things into being. When God said something, what he said came into being. The things that you speak are going to come into being. Now, if you're speaking the wrong things, you're going to bring the wrong things into being. You can be giving place to the enemy. You can actually be shutting down God and hindering him by speaking wrong things and affecting you adversely. You can be sowing evil things into your heart as well, which is a mistake. This is why you've got to watch the things you speak. James 1.26, if any man among you seem to be religious, and being religious is not wrong. People talk about, think religion means something bad. No, it's someone who's fearing, worshiping God, and truly walking in the ways of the Lord. It's fine. And bridles not his tongue. He's just speaking anything. But deceiveth his own heart. What happens if you speak wrong things? You're deceiving yourself. Well, how could that be? Because what you're speaking is not only going out, it's also going in. It's deceiving you on the inside of you. This is why a tape recorder out of your voice sounds different than you speaking it yourself. It sounds different to you, doesn't it? Because you're hearing it differently because it's being spoken on the inside of you. Notice what happens if he's deceived his heart. The man's religion is vain. It's devoid of force. Truth, success, result, it's useless of no purpose. Otherwise, he's going nowhere because of his mouth. You've got to learn to speak right words or you can be doing, accomplishing nothing. Everything's going nowhere. You're spinning your wheels spiritually, so to speak. What a mistake. And you've got to realize you can't just say, well, I'm, I'm going to take those words back. It doesn't work that way. Words are releasers. You can confess sin of what you've spoken, but it didn't stop what went forth, because what went forth went forth. Here's evidence of it. Remember Isaac, deceived by Jacob? What happened here? This is where he comes. Remember, he came before Esau. And he came near, kissed him, smelled the smell of his raiment, blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my sons is the smell of the field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore, God give thee the dew of heaven, the fatness of the earth, the plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren. Let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. That blessing was released. What happened? Esau comes in a little bit later. Isaac, trembling very exceedingly, said, Who? Where is he that hath taken the venison and brought it to me, and eaten of all before thou camest, and have blessed him? Yea, and he shall be blessed, because the words were released. He couldn't say, well, wait a minute, that's a mistake, I'm taking that back. Doesn't work that way, because words release things. That means your words, you can confess them as sin, 
and receive forgiveness from, but still what you've spoken, it's gone forth. That's why you always want to watch what words you speak at all times. He couldn't do anything about it. And he said, bless me, even me also, Esau was saying. And he said, thy brother came with subtly and taken away thy blessing, and he couldn't change it. Your words are releasing things. Make sure that you are conquering the words of your mouth by only speaking right words. Do not think for a minute that your words that were wrong haven't been released and having some kind of effect. Yes, they are. They're having an effect. You want to make sure you're speaking right words. Not only to when you're dealing with in life with people, but you need to watch the words you're even speaking to God. Don't be complaining, griping, negative, murmuring. What happened? With, you know, you murmur, you're going to get destroyed of the destroyer, it says. Look what it says in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 2. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. If you're going to speak words to God, they better count. They better be the right words. Don't let yourself just be rambling on or complaining, griping, and tell, him, they tell him, him all your problems and so forth. You're supposed to pray the word, the answer, not just carry on about things. That's not what you do. It comes to verse 6. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. You can sin with your mouth because you're speaking wrong words. Neither say thou before the angel, and the angels are listening, remember, to everything. Oh, that it was an error. Sorry, that was the wrong thing to speak. Don't do anything. Just ignore that. <laughs> Doesn't work. You can't say it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands because you didn't speak the right things? Otherwise, you've got to watch the words you speak. Your words are important. They can even cause the destruction of the work of your hands because you spoke wrong things. Your words are releasers. Your words are carriers. Your words are depositing things even within you. Your words are putting things forth and you can't take them back. You've got to correct them, that's for sure, and start speaking right words. Now these guys that think that they can just do anything they want, <laughs> oh boy, they're under judgments like you wouldn't believe. But you have to understand Remember, you're bought with a price, you belong to the Lord. Look what it says here. Psalms 12, verse 3. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and tongues that speak proud things. That's right, they're going to be judged. Who have said, with our tongue will we prevail. They're just, they're just speaking what they want to do. Our lips are our own. Who's Lord over us? <laughs> are your lips your own? No. You're bought with a price. You're a purchased possession. You belong to Him. With your tongue, will you prevail? No. Only if you're speaking God's words will you see it work. And are your lips or your own? No. And if you haven't submitted your, your tongue to Him, is He really Lord over you? No. You've got to submit your mouth to start speaking right things at all times. That is so important. Look here at Job. Chapter 6, verse 24. Teach me, and I will hold my tongue, and cause me to understand wherein I've erred. And have you been speaking wrong things, and God wants to teach you, so you will hold your tongue, and then you'll understand where you've erred with your tongue, speaking wrong things that shut down God from working, or gave place to the devil, or stopped things or even cause the destruction of the work of your hands, or sowed evil things into you, or into other people. What a mistake. You've got to make sure that you are doing the right thing. You've got to correct the things that you have spoken. Right words will produce tremendous results, of course. Samuel was one who spoke right words. Look what it says in 1 Samuel 3, 19. Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. That meant they were all producing. Why is that? Because he spoke right words. That tells you something. If you speak right words, your words won't fall to the ground and be non-productive. They will produce results. 
they will bring the promises of God to pass. They will see the work of God be accomplished through your words. Your words are important. They'll produce results if they're right words. If not, there'll be judgments that come. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. That means the fruit with the things that have been coming out of my mouth, I'm going to be satisfied with. Because remember, it's releasing something. And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. And then he goes on and says an important thing in verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You mean I can speak death with my tongue and I'm going to, I'm going to be filled with it and affected by it? You absolutely will. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. You can bring death or you can bring life. It all depends on the things that you are speaking. Think about what you're speaking before you speak. Don't be quick to just speak. Be slow to speak, remember it says. That's what he wants. Proverbs 6, 2. Thou art snared. You've been snared with the words of your mouth, if they're wrong. Thou art taken. This word actually means captured. Who captures you? The devil does. Because you gave place to him and evil spirits will come into you and now you've got these evil spirits in you. But you spoke wrong words. You got mad. You got upset. You were spoke bitter. You spoke evil. You complained. You griped. You murmured. You carried on. You got upset. Oh, you're, you're getting captured by the enemy. You got to learn to speak right words at all times. That is absolutely essential. Now, so therefore, because we're going to conquer this tongue, make sure we're only speaking right things. Look what it says in Psalms 39.1. I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. You can sin with your tongue by speaking things contrary to the word. I will keep this is the word shamar, meaning guard my mouth with a bridle while the wicked's before me. Well, you have to do it all the time, not just when the wicked's before you. I'm not going to sin with my tongue. If I sin with my tongue, I'm going to give place to the devil. I've got to guard my mouth with a bridle. I've got to make sure this thing is not doing, speaking anything that's contrary to the Word of God. Psalms 19. Verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Well, that's what we want. That's what's supposed to happen. You speak the right words, it'll be acceptable. You speak the wrong words, it won't be acceptable whatsoever. And that scripture we were referring to earlier, the, the Proverbs chapter 4, where it speaks of the word here in verse 20, the Proverbs 4.20, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings, be listening to them. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them or guard them in the midst of thine heart. Their life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. And so watch over your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the outgoings, this means, of life. Because what comes into your heart? the word. And what comes out of the abundance of your heart? Your mouth's going to be speaking. And that's what's going to release the power of God to bring forth the outgoings of life into manifestation for you. So you've got to watch over it. You've got to guard your heart. And of course, when the word comes to you, what is the devil going to try to do? Well, one of the things he's going to try to do is come to get that word out of your heart by you not doing it. Mark chapter 4, verse 15 in the parable of the sower, these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. When they have heard, Satan comes immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Why was that? Because they didn't do it. If you don't do it, you won't incorporate it into your lifestyle, and the enemy will take it out because you won't get spiritual understanding of it. You may have a, a knowledge of it in your mind in a sense, but only through hearing and doing the word do you get revelation as it get established in you. Remember, if you're just a doer of the word, not a hearer only, you're deceiving your own self. Because only the ones that hear and doers are the ones that are going to be blessed in their doings, it says in James chapter 1. 
So the devil's coming to try to get this word out of you. That's why you got to guard your heart. But of course, you got to get the word in your heart. And you can't let all this evil stuff come into your heart. Of course, the enemy is trying to get to your words all the time. Psalms 56. We've seen this scripture before. We talked about it with our thoughts, but it's very revealing to us about our words as well. Psalms 56, verse 5, talking about what the enemies do. Every day they rest. They're trying to get to your words. This word rest is referring to be able to turn, to distort, to get this thing uh, uh, to uh, shape or form this in a wrong way is really what it refers to in this sense. All their thoughts are against me for evil. So they're trying to get to your words, turn your words away, get your words to speak wrong things, anything contrary to the word. You got to watch your words. Of course, will the flesh want to speak the things of the word of God? No, it wants to speak whatever the human nature wants to. It gets you to react. You can't be a reactor. You need to be thinking what the word says and slow to speak before you speak. Remember what happened. You see, you can't, you can't sit there and think, well, they provoked me, they got me all upset, and I happened to speak some things. God understands, you know. Uh, that, that didn't work. Did it work for uh, Moses? No. Remember in Psalms 106, 32, they angered him at the waters, waters of strife so that it went ill with Moses for their sakes. Because they provoked his spirit so that he spake unadvisably with his lips. So he spoke the wrong things. You can't be speaking wrong things. He provoked, he spoke the wrong things. God expects you to speak right things. You can't be a reactor. Don't let people push your buttons and get you to react and get upset. No. You need to be speaking right words and not be reacting negatively. We see something here in James that we want to look at where they talks about this. And we want to actually begin in chapter 3 for a moment to show you some things that are important. A lot of people haven't seen this, but they don't, I don't know why. They haven't looked at it. My brethren, do not become, literally, this is the word become, if you notice below. And this is a command imperative, ongoingly. Do not be, become, on an ongoing basis, many teachers, didaskalos. Otherwise, you don't want a whole lot of teachers. You only want teachers that are going to have a ministry gift and will teach accurately and effectively and know what they're speaking because they got to be speaking the truth because they're under the greater condemnation and you can't be hearing things that are wrong. That's why you got to watch what you're hearing. I'm astounded at so many people that are all over the internet and hear all these kind of things and they're in confusion and you're hearing all kind of things that are crazy. You better be sure you're only hearing right words and you got to check everything out and be good Bereans, search the scriptures to see if the things are so. And you got to know the word yourself. Notice he's commanding, become not many teachers. There shouldn't be them. Knowing that we shall receive, talking about the teachers, shall receive the greater judgments. They will. Anybody that's teaching the word, if you're not teaching accurately, you're in trouble. You're going to be judged. That's why he only has those people that he's called, that have been gifted, them given a ministry gift, and those ones that will then carry it out and do the due diligence that they need to do to teach the word accurately and effectively. There's too many out there that they don't do that and they're failing and they're going to be under judgment if they don't do their due diligence. Then he goes on and says, for in many things we, who's he talking about? He's still talking about the teachers because it's taught, it was taught about plural, first person plural. And when it speaks about offending, this is really in this sense because it's talking about the teachers, they're erring or making mistakes. Well, that's if they haven't done their due diligence. But if any man, then it switches, says if any man, it's singular now, is not erring or making a mistake in word, which is what he can come to, 
if he's done his due diligence and do what's right. The same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. He's going to lead and hold and check and restrain the whole body. And that would especially be speaking because the teacher is speaking who? To the body of Christ. So they don't, they don't, make, they don't get off in the wrong track by hearing wrong things. Because remember, if the blind follows the blind, they both fall in the ditch and everybody's in trouble. That's why it's got to be accurate. It's got to be right. It's got to be on the mark and there can't be any mistakes. Now he begins to talk about these words that you're speaking. He says, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. The ships, even they so great, are driven to fierce winds, yet they're turned about with a very small helm whithersoever the governor listeth. The rudder on the ship. Little member, you know, little, little, they've got the bridle on the horse. You've got the rudder on the ship directing the thing. So is the tongue. Your tongue is directing what's going on in your life. It's a little member. Boasting great things. Behold how great a matter. A little fire can kindle or set on fire, light up and put in operation. Your tongue can light some wrong things, can put into fire, up, up into fires essentially. Kindle really means to set ablaze, more, or less, more uh, literally. Here, to set a fire, set a blaze, or set a fire, it can mean when you look it up in the lexicons. The tongue is a fire. Talking about the tongue that's coming out of someone who doesn't speak the word. A world of unrighteousness. This is the word adakia. They have it, iniquity here, but it means unrighteousness. Meaning, that you can be put in your, the, the tongue, which is a fire, you can be put into operation unrighteousness because you're speaking wrong things. So is the tongue among our members. Remember, we have the law of sin in our members. That's why we can never trust our mouth to be speaking things that are right unless we're speaking things in line with the word. And it defileth the whole body. It can defile and spot. You're not supposed to have spots. Remember, Jesus is going to present to himself a church without spot, without wrinkle. We can't be spotted. Your tongue can spot you, cause you to be defiled, defiling the whole body, and sets on fire. It ignites, it sets on fire for destruction here. The course or the wheel of where something be begins to comes into being. Genesis refers to that which is an origin or a birth. Otherwise, you're speaking, where you're speaking it from is putting into the wheel or the course or the operation of what, you've been, what you spoke into being. And it is set on fire of hell. Now, it's very interesting. This is the word Gehenna. Gehenna is the word that refers to the place of punishment and destruction, this particular word. It was the place of punishment. What this is pointing out is your tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. It's in our members, and it's a member of the law of sins in it. It defiles you, and it will set on fire the wheel or the operation, essentially, the course of what you bring into being, the origin of it, what you're speaking. And this, of course, is set on fire of what? Of that which is going to take you to punishment because you're going to be judged by your words and you're going to be punished. This doesn't mean the fact that you're, you're going to go to hell. You can confess your sins, but you are putting in operation that which is the destructive effects of what hell, which is a place of punishment and destruction. Otherwise, you can bring destruction forth on yourself. And then he goes on and he says, Every kind of beast and of birds and serpents and of things in the sea is tamed, has been tamed of mankind, by man being able to do this, by human nature. Literally, this says, human nature. There's actually two words here. That's the word for human below here. Then, but the tongue can no man, man himself, in the flesh, he can't tame it because it's unruly evil, full of deadly poison because it's got the law of sin dwelling in it, remember? 
So it's just going to speak all kinds of things that are wrong. So, therefore, it says we bless God, even the Father, but there we curse men made up the similitude of God. We can't be speaking blessing one minute and cursing the next minute. We shouldn't be speaking the cursing ever. And then he goes on and says, out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not, it's not necessary that this be becoming the past. It should not be happening otherwise. You need to be speaking right words. Because, remember, you can be speaking that which is going to bring blessing or release blessing. You can be speaking that which is going to release cursing or even bring cursing and destruction upon you, judgment, because you're setting on fire that which is going to bring judgment and punishment upon you. Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter water? No. Because your mouth, if it's coming forth from the word in your heart, it's coming from God. If it's coming forth from the flesh, from the law of sin in your members, it's, bringing, it's not coming from the same place. It's coming a bunch of bitterness and evil stuff's coming out of you. You can't be doing that. Can a fig tree, my brother, bear olive berries, either a vine figs, so can no fountain yield both salt water and fresh. It's going to yield one or the other. So what's going to be the answer? The answer is you got to get the word in you. And how are you going to be able to deal with this since the human nature cannot tame it or subdue it? It's only by God. And how is God going to do it? Through the word in you. When the word's in you, then out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will be speaking from the word that's in you. And it's also, remember, not only written in your heart, but it's also written in your mind in the New Testament. At the same time, does that mean that God's totally in control of everything, that, of, of the, the, my tongue? No, because you also have a part to play as well. You get the word in you, but then remember in Romans chapter 6, verse 13, it tells us about yielding our members. Now you have members, and your member, one of your little members, your tongue. Neither yield, this is a command to you and me. Do not yield, imperative mood, your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. That'd be speaking wrong things. But you yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members, you're yielding them as instruments of righteousness unto God because what are you going to speak? The word of righteousness. You're only going to speak right words. Remember, sin shall not have dominion over you because you're not a sinner any longer. You now are a righteous spirit and you can yield to the word of righteousness and speak right things. Look at verse 16. Know ye not that to whom? Well, that's a spiritual authority, a person. You yield yourself servants to obey his servants you are to whom you obey. Whether of sin unto death, well, if I'm sinning, who am I obeying? The devil, who's working at you to get you to sin, trying to rest your words. Or of obedience, well, who, who would I be yielding to then? To God, speaking the right words. And what does that produce? Righteousness. And that's what he wants. God expects you to yield your mouth to him and to be obedient choosing to speak only the things he wants. That's why you think about what you're speaking before you speak. Look what it says back in Psalms. We need to conquer the words of our mouth. Many people wonder why things aren't happening for them. They speak the word one minute and then they go and speak a bunch of negative things the next minute and they wonder, well, why didn't I see anything happen? Because you undid everything. <laughs> you shut it all down. Psalm 17, verse 3, Thou hast proved mine heart, thou hast visited me in the night, thou hast tried me and shall find nothing. There's nothing wrong here. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. God wants you to purpose. I'm not going to transgress with my mouth. Because we're conquering this little member. We're conquering our every area, including the words of our mouth. So you are to purpose that your mouth is not going to transgress. You need to be thinking about this every day. You get up in the morning, I'm purposing my mouth is not going to transgress today. I'm going to make sure that I am only speaking right things. Psalms 141, verse 3. 
Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. We're on the New Testament. You and I are now responsible for it, remember. And the door of my lips, that's what I'm letting come in or letting go out. A door or something that lets something go in and out. You want to be sure that you're only bringing things in. Or this is really, the door would mean what's going forth out of your mouth in this sense. So you're going to have to guard it. Guard your mouth and keep the door so it's only speaking right things. You don't want any perverse things coming out of your mouth. You don't want any things that are going to bring destruction. That is so important. Now, of course, you've got to guard yourself. If you don't guard yourself, you're going to be affected. This is why you've got to watch what words you hear. Judges chapter 16, verse 16. This is talking about Delilah and Samson. Notice, it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words. Her words kept working at him and working at him and working at him and working at him and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. It grieved him and he finally broke through. And so what did he finally do? He told her all his heart. What a mistake. He said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, my strength will go from me and I'll become weak and be like any other man. And that's what happened. The words that he heard affected him. Don't let evil words affect you. You cannot allow evil words to work against you. In fact, they will affect you if you don't deal with them properly. Job 19, verse 2. How long will you vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? They're affecting you in your will and like emotions, and they're causing damage with the words coming into you. This is why you, can, you must deal with the words. If anybody speaks words that are wrong against you, what do you do? Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon is formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn it. I have people who speak words against me. You've had people speak words against you. I've had people speak all kinds of things against me. And they're still speaking against me today, even in this city, amazingly. They never come to talk to me about anything. All they do is just speak negative things. And all over the place, it's happened for all, you know, anytime you're speaking the word and you're not going to compromise, people are going to speak against you. You condemn every tongue. You don't get moved by it. But you don't let it work at you. So you'll make a mistake and get, allow it to affect you and, and vex your soul. You condemn every tongue that rises against you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me. And see, people will be actually vessels of the devil, whether they realize it or not, whether they're people of the world or even people who are born, born from above. They can be speaking wrong things. Lamentations 3.46 says, All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. If people open their mouths against you, that makes them an enemy. If you're speaking right things and they're speaking wrong things, right? If people are speaking against you, what are you going to do? Are you going to be moved by it? No, you're going to condemn that. They're speaking against you and there's no reason for them to, they're, they're, they can't, there's no reproach on your part, no sin on your part. They're speaking things that are wrong. These are enemies. They're actually an enemy against you if they're speaking things. Paul had to deal with that. He said their, house, their mouths need to be stopped. <laughs> enemies will speak against you. And you say, well, words, don't they affect you all the time? Not if you, unless, you deal, unless you react to them wrong. Look in 1 Samuel 17. Here is where Goliath comes, the, ch the champion of the Philistines. And the Philistine, this is Goliath, said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul, he's the king, and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. What did those words do? <laughs> they damaged him. They sowed evil things into him. And they reacted to him 
they responded to them. They didn't deal with them properly, and it caused the damage to them. They got dismayed and got greatly afraid. Well, when we come down to verse 23, this is later, David now is going to help deal with the situation. As he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the fist listing of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of listing, spake according to the same words, same words, and David heard them. Did he get dismayed and greatly afraid? No. Wrong words, if you don't react incorrectly, will not affect you adversely. But if you react wrongly, they will damage you for sure. If you learn to how to deal with things, you can live above being hurt or wounded and not being moved by anything that comes at you. If you haven't learned to do that, you've probably gotten beat up by the devil through people left and right. You've got a lot of hurts, wounds, and damaged emotions. We've got to learn to conquer anything and everything that comes against us. David heard them. What was his response? David spake to the monk, stood by, and said, he didn't get upset. He said, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? He's out to destroy this guy, not to react and get greatly afraid and dismayed. He's going to eliminate this guy, <clears throat> take away the reproach from Israel, for who's this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? <laughs> he didn't have a covenant with God. And later on, he says in verse 34, he said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. I went after him and smote him and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard, smote him, and flew, slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. He had a covenant with God, and God delivered him out of the enemies. And this guy, no matter how big they are, seeing he's defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he'll deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. God will deliver you out of everything if you respond properly and do what the Word says. You cannot be moved by those negative words. Remember, you have authority over all the power of the enemy. Look what it says in Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I give unto you a power, this is the word exousia, meaning authority, to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power, dunamis, of the enemy. You have authority over all the power of the enemy. And the enemy's working through people or through however, through words and speaking against you and so forth. And nothing, not shall, remember, We've talked about it in the past, but you haven't seen this. This is not a future tense verb. It's a subjunctive mood, meaning a conditional statement. It would literally say nothing might by any means hurt you. Conditional. Meaning if you respond, react to it wrongly, it'll hurt you and wound you. Or if you don't use your authority against the power of the enemy and stop what he's doing, it can hurt you as well. Otherwise, you got to deal with this successfully. You're going to condemn the tongues, anything that would rise against you. You're not going to be moved by the evil words and get afraid or dismayed. You're going to realize you have a covenant with God. You can take this enemy out and destroy him. You have authority over all the power of the enemy and you're going to defeat the enemy. You got to handle things properly. That is so important. We see many people are not doing what they need to do. Look what we see over in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord, mine horn is exalted in the Lord, my mouth is enlarged over mine enemies. Oh, that means my mouth can be enlarged over my enemies if I speak the right thing and I can conquer them. Because I rejoice in thy salvation. He's not going to be moved by these things. She's going to speak the right things. You can be over your enemies if you speak the right things and conquer them. You have to conquer the attacks that come against you. That is so important. 
Now, we need to understand people will try to attack you and bring lies to you. You've got to be ready to deal with those things. By just, what do you, what's the answer? Speak the truth and speak the Word of God and declare what the Word says. For instance, I've had people come uh, uh, and I had one guy not too long ago call me up and said he liked everything that he hears, but there's one thing that's not right. Casting out demons. He didn't like that. So what am I going to do? I have to, what's the answer? I'm going to give him the word, so I give him the truth, and I'm also going to extinguish that, that lying, fiery dart trying to speak a negative thing against me and condemn me and put me down for speaking what God wants. So I immediately said, well, Mark 16, 17 says, These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out demons. That means all believers are supposed to cast out demons, right? He didn't have any answer to that one. You speak the word to bring forth the answer to help people, if they will. This guy didn't receive it, unfortunately. He's, well, he, he wanted to agree to disagree kind of a thing. <laughs> no, I'm not going to agree to disagree. I'm just going to speak the truth to you. I told him, so you're a believer, you're responsible to cast out demons, and you don't cast them out of people out of the world because they don't have a covenant with God and they're going to get worse. The demons will come back in. You're supposed to do it. Everybody's to do it. And so you dealt successfully. So the seed in them and told them what they need to do. We need to be ready to speak forth the word and declare one thing. You never back off what the truth is. You can't back it off whatever. That is important. Now also, when anything comes against you, you can't be afraid of things. You know, like these guys, they were afraid the devil's coming to attack them, and so forth. David, you know, they were attacking him. You can't be afraid of things like that. And let me bring this up to something that will be helpful for you to understand. Not only have I been, have, have we've had people attack, and you probably about casting out demons, but also about binding, loosing, and casting down spirits out of the heavenlies. So what's going to be the answer for that? People come against you and try to tell you you're, you're wrong and all that stuff. Well, you've got to have the, what the Word says in you, and you've got to get established in it. In fact, even, I'll just show you another real quick one. There was a person who just wrote me just the other day, and heard something from a, what they, the person described them as a famous pastor. And the famous pastor was saying, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, 34, let your women keep silence in the churches. He said, that settles it all. Women's ministry is on nothing. You can't do it. You can't open your mouth or do anything. <laughs> she knew it was a lie. But she had to get herself straight so she went and she found the message that I did on women's ministry and listened to the whole thing, wrote down all the scriptures, got it all established, and so she wasn't moved. You've got to have the word in you so you're not moved by anything, otherwise it could affect you adversely. It could deceive you by receive, listening to a lie. And of course, what's the answer? This isn't talking about women in general. How do you know? Because the next verse says, if they'll learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. This is talking about a wife. It's the same word in the Greek. And furthermore, what was the problem? The men were educated and the wives weren't at back the, those days. And the, wives sat, the women sat on one side, the men sat on another side. And so what was happening? In the midst of the church service, the woman was calling across, the wife was calling across to the husband. She wanted to learn something. What's that mean, you know? Hey, they're supposed to keep silence and hold their peace in the churches. They're to be under obedience and ask their husbands at their home. It's a shame for them to be speaking out and being disruptive. That's what it's talking about. It has nothing to do with women not being able to speak. Of course, in the New Testament, remember, there isn't any male or female anymore in God's standpoint. <laughs> We're all one in Christ. Women can operate in ministry just as well as men. Don't anybody ever tell you that. It's a lie. Well, she got established in that. She didn't get moved by that. 
you got to make sure you don't get moved by anything that anybody says. And I see too many people, they get moved by what someone says. For instance, let's talk about the heavenlies. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Who's that talking about? All believers? I'm sitting together in heavenly places? I thought I was here. How can that be? How am I seated together in heavenly places? Where were you born from? Above. What spirit did you get? The spirit of Jesus Christ. What are you? You're a firstborn citizen of heaven. You're just, you've been sent here as an ambassador. You're a sojourner here, remember? So where does your spirit come from in heaven? So where is your position, even though you are a foreigner and a, a one who is ambassador for Christ come to this foreign land, so to speak, because you got a new spirit from above? That's why you're sitting together. So that means I'm in a position of authority in heaven, in Christ. I'm in that position of authority. Well, what am I supposed to do, remember? Luke chapter 10, verse 19. He's given us authority to tread on serpents, scorpions, over all the power of the enemy. Where are the, where are the evil spirits operating? They're operating in the earth. They're operating in people. They're operating all over the place. They're operating in the heavenlies. Principalities, powers, the authorities, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. Does all mean all? It sure does. Wherever there are. It didn't qualify anything. It says all. Well, is there something to indicate that I am to deal with these spirits in the heavenlies? Ephesians 6.12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities. And this word wrestles really talking about like a, a contest in fighting and struggling against, which is what we're doing in spiritual warfare, against principalities and authorities, exousia, the rulers of the darkness of this age, and a spiritual wickedness there in the heavenlies. Here's the word, plural, heavenlies, and the heavenly places. So, I am supposed to, I'm supposed to be fighting against these. Well, Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, says, I will give unto thee the keys. What are keys? Means of access to something. Of the kingdom, which is the rule and reign, of what? Of heaven. Is that what it means? You know, we have to look up everything. Let's look at this word heaven in the Greek. Here it is. This is the Scrivener's, the basis for the Texas Receptus. Here's the word for heaven. It's plural. Well, how come they didn't translate it plural? You have to ask them. All I know is that they made a big mistake. It's heavens. Whatsoever thou mayest bind upon earth shall be, or that's, the, that's the Young's, uh, whatsoever you might bind, shall bind on earth shall be bound in heavens, you're going to find, and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loose in the heavens, because all three of those are plural. Here's the second one. Heavens. Here's the third one. Heavens. Well, that means God has given you and me the means of access to the rule and the reign of the heavens. And so, where are you and I on earth? Whatsoever you, not shall bind, but really it's might bind, because you have to meet the condition of doing it, since it's subjunctive mood, on earth, which is where we are, shall be, that's the main verb in the clause, not, there aren't helper verbs for bound, shall be, that's the main verb, having been bound, the word bound is a participle, which is like a verbal adjective, having been bound in the heavens. That's why Young's translates it good. This, why do we have Young's up here? It's the best translation to show the Greek, how it's rendered. That's why we put it up here and refer to it. Whatsoever you might bind upon her shall be, having been bound in the heavens. Well, that means my authority operating here, speaking, affects the, in the heavens. And the angels go into operation to bind these spirits up in the heavens. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be, having been loosed in the heavens, same thing. 
Well, if he gave those keys to you and me, that means we're supposed to use them. That means we're to bind and we are to loose from our position on earth and it will take effect in the heavens where all these evil spirits are. You can bind these spirits and loose and untie their hold and you can also cast them down because he's given you authority and dominion over them. We also see Matthew eleven twelve, and the same thing, days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom, the rule and the reign of not heaven, so this is why Young's, he does a good job on these, he did. Heavens, plural. So, the rule and the reign of the heavens is suffering violence. Violence and force is being inflicted upon it. Who's doing that? You and I are. And the violent, the violent, strong, forceful ones coming against the rule and the reign of the heavens where these evil spirits are, are seizing control of it, literally, harpazo. That's the same word used about when we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air, harpazo, seizing control of it. Because you and I are to use the authority to conquer the enemies. Now, people have said, well, you're not supposed to do that because if you fight against them, they're going to attack you and you're going to get all beat up and wounded. Have you heard that one before? First of all, we have authority over all the power of the enemy. If that statement that I just made is true, that you're going to get attacked and beat up by the enemy by attacking the spirits in the heavenlies, well, wouldn't that also apply for casting out demons? They're enemies too. If I cast out demons, when I, they're going to come attack me and I'm going to get all beat up too. So if I can't, I, sh I shouldn't attack them in the heavenlies. I certainly shouldn't attack them in people. I'm going to get wiped out left and right. That's ridiculous. Do we back off because we ca if demons are trying to come against us when we cast them out? No, we just conquer them and overcome them. Do, would we back off if something's attacking us because we're attacking the spirits, binding, loosing, and casting them down in the heavenlies? No. You conquer them. In fact, look what the scripture says in Isaiah. Chapter 59. Here it speaks about the intercessor. He's looking for an intercessor. And so the intercessor puts on all these things, the breastplate of, right, of, of righteousness, breastplate, helmet of salvation on his head. Well, that's the armor of God, isn't it? Garments of vengeance for clothing, clad with zeal as a cloth. He's going to go after these enemies if he's garments of vengeance. That's attack. Destroy the enemies. According to their deeds, according to will pay fury to his adversaries. The intercessors used to just destroy the works of the enemy. All these evil spirits operate in the heavenlies. Recompense to his enemies. To the islands he'll pay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rise of the sun. So could the enemy try to attack you? Well, sure, he could kind of attack you. I mean, you get the word in you, he's going to try to attack you to take the word out. You try to cast out demons, he's going to try to attack you because he'd like to come back in. You attack them in the heavenlies and cast them down, they're going to try to attack you to, come, to try to affect you adversely, to stop you from doing that because you're affecting their rule and reign. Since when do you ever back off because someone might be attacking you? That's crazy. You know what that tells me? Those people don't know they have authority over all the power of the enemy and that nothing might hurt them. If they knew their authority and were using it, they know they could conquer everything. Look what happens. When the enemy comes in like a flood, oh, the enemy's coming. <laughs> Look what happens to the intercessor who knows what he's doing. The Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against them. What does that mean? Well, we have to check this out. When we talk about this standard, this is in this polel stem. And the stems are important because the polel stem means to drive at. He's going to drive against, drive at against him. That means the Holy Spirit's going to go into operation because you're, of course, operating in your authority, conquering the enemies. And he's going to drive at the enemy, and the enemy's not going to get to you. He's going to be driven out. He's going to be conquered. He's going to drive at him. It's astounding that people think these kind of things. Are you and I, how about when the enemy uh, targets you because he wants to wipe you out? Romans 
chapter 8. Oops, Romans, that is. This. Look what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 35 and following. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who would be doing that? The devil. What's he try? He tries all kinds of things. Tribulations, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, any kind of attack. As it's written, we're, for our sake we're killed all the day long, we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Who views us that way? The devil does. So he's going to attack you. So does that mean, uh-oh, I'm going to get attacked by the devil now. I better not try to ruffle any feathers here in the heavenlies or anything. No, that's ridiculous. Look what it says. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. And this literally says, because it's a verb, we are being completely victorious. If God's made, causing you to be completely victorious, are any of the enemy attacks going to prevail against you? No, if you know what you're doing and you're using your authority against all the power of the enemy, because then nothing by any means might hurt you because you met the conditions. Do you have authority and dominion over every work of the enemy? Absolutely. You know, people have said this, well, you shouldn't be attacking the heavens, you're going to get attacked. That's a lie. You're supposed to do it. You're supposed to destroy the works of the enemy and you won't get it. You, you'll get victory. I've been doing this for 40 years. I haven't gotten beat up and destroyed by the enemy. I've been casting out from the heavenlies and I've been casting demons out of people since 1984 when I learned about deliverance for 40 years. All these people, if you're getting attacked, then you must not know what you're doing. You must not know your authority. You must not be conquering the enemies and overcoming them. It's astounding. You know, you could say the same thing about uh, casting out demons. Well, if you cast out demons, they're going to come against you too. They sure will. And now, if you don't know what you're doing, they could get to you. Look at Matthew 12, 43. When unclean spirits gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest, finding none. So it was cast out of him. Well, what's the spirit decide he's going to do? Read the next verse. Then he says, I'll return to my house. He considers you your house. I'm going back into my house. He's, he's, not, he's not going to be satisfied for you to throw him out. From whence I came out. When he's come, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. Goes he, takes with himself seven other spirits, more wicked themselves. They enter and let there and dwell there. The last state of the man's worse than the first. Even so shall it be into this wicked generation. Well, that says this, that means I'm going to get attacked and I'm going to be in worse shape. Does that mean I'm not going to try to cast out demons when God told me to cast out demons? What are we supposed to do if any attacks come? Did Jesus run and hide when the devil was after him? No, he spoke the word and extinguished the fiery darts of the wicked one. What does the Bible say that we do when the enemy attacks? How do we conquer everything? With the word of God, remember. Submit yourselves therefore to God, get the word in you, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You can resist him and he'll flee from you. You can drive him out and conquer him. You know, I see it's quite contradictory when you think there's people out there that say you shouldn't be coming against the evil spirits and the heavenlies because you're going to get attacked and get wounded and beat up and that's wrong. But they tell you it's okay to cast out demons. That's contradictory, isn't it? It's ridiculous. We should be casting out of the heavenlies and we should be casting out of people. In fact, we should be taking authority over the devil wherever he is and conquering him in every situation because you have authority over all the power of the enemy. What's astounding is how people will listen to the voice that says you shouldn't do it. What's wrong with them? Did they examine the scriptures? Obviously not. Did they even come and try to discuss it with someone who has been teaching the truth of the Word of God and all these things, even if they've heard it themselves? No. That's quite an indictment against people who have been ta listening to lying doctrines of devils telling you and you're not supposed to cast out demons out of people or cast them down from the heavenlies. See, what's the devil going to try to do? He's going to try to stop people from warfare in all aspects and destroy the works of the enemy across the board. It's astounding. 
And what's going to happen? Remember when people aren't speaking truth? They're going to be judged. Judgments will come. What do you, how do you handle when someone does that? You're not going to pray judgment against them. No way. He says, the Lord is the one who judges his people. What are you going to do? You're going to pray for what they have need of, remember? So what do you pray? Pray for them. You give them the word of God like I gave to that one guy or other people. Give them the word of God. Share the truth. Encourage them to do what's right. Pray for them to come to repentance. Pray for God to send labors. Pray for them to open the eyes of their understanding so that they'll come to the place of repentance so they won't be yielding to the devil and in false things. Am I going to be moved by someone speaking? No, I'm going to condemn their tongues. Are you going to be moved by anything? You shouldn't be. If you are moved by it and you believe lies, well, you better be sure you're believing the truth. If you're not believing the truth, you're in trouble. You've got to be believing the truth. So you've got to find out, just like the one woman, she did excellent. She wrote me and said, I heard them saying that the women can't minister, and I knew it was wrong, and so I, I had to get the word. She got the word, listened to everything, and she's got it straight. That didn't affect her whatsoever. She didn't get deceived by that lying teaching that said that women can't do anything in ministry, which is a lie from the pit of hell. It's a doctrine of the devil. You can't, don't let anything that anybody tells you that's contrary to the word move you. And if it uh, causes a question, you got to get in the Word and find out what it says and get the truth established in you so you're not affected adversely by it. That's important. And don't speak negative things. You don't speak negative things against the person. You speak what they have need of, remember. And you can, but you condemn tongues that would rise against you in judgment. I've had people come at me for all kinds of things. I mean, for years. They used to get mad because I was talked about how Jesus died spiritually and went down to hell. <laughs> they had a, I've had, had people attack me continually. Is that going to move you? No. Many people have even quit the ministry because of the fact they got so beat up by all the attacks coming, they couldn't, they just threw in the towel. That's crazy. If you do the word and you condemn everything, you can live above hurt. I learned a long time ago, 40 years ago, to live above hurt. You don't have to ever get hurt again. You have authority over all the power of the enemy. Now, if someone brings something and they're true, right and you are wrong, you get ready to repent on the spot and get things right. But if they're speaking things that are wrong, you condemn the tongues and you stand up for what's right and you pray for all those people to come to repentance so that they won't see destructive things. And one thing's for sure though, if someone is, is speaking wrong things, they're gonna be, the judgment's gonna come upon them. It's sad, but it's gonna happen. It's not what God wants. He wants everybody to come to repentance, remember. But nonetheless, it's gonna happen. Don't get an attitude. Walk in love, walk in peace. Don't be moved, don't be rattled by what anybody says against you. You just walk in the truth. And you just pray and do what the Word says. And you just make yourself, make sure you're on target with the Word and keep giving forth the Word and do what God wants you to do in every situation. Doesn't matter who's coming against you or they speak whatever, any. Anytime spe someone's speaking something contrary, get the Word, speak the Word, give them the truth if they'll listen, condemn the tongues, make sure you got the Word established in you. You're going to be a doer of the Word. You're not going to be moved and you're not going to let it penetrate you and eat you. You're not going to revolve it in your mind forever and think about all those things they said about me. You can't do that. You're going to destroy yourself. You're giving place to the enemy by that. You just do what the Word says, and you can live above hurt, and make sure your words are speaking right words. Don't be complaining. Don't be griping. Don't be talking about all the things they did to me or said against me. Uh, your mouths are now destroying yourself. We can't be doing that. Make sure you're always doing. Jesus got rejected by everybody, all, all, all kinds of things. He didn't get beat up by the enemy. He just spoke the word of God. And when they came against him, he just gave them the truth, didn't he? He always gave them what they had need to hear. That's how you're going to learn to do things. You're going to make sure your mouth's speaking right before God. 
so you don't speak things that are, well, that was an error. No, sorry. <laughs> that won't go over with the angel. Remember, what you speak, it's been released. It's out there. You can confess your sin for it, but nonetheless, it's already out there. So learn to be slow to speak and watch the words you speak. Don't be moved by negative things that come at you. Be sure that you have the word established in you and you speak the truth and you always live above anything that the enemy would try to get to you and vex your soul or hurt you or damage you or wound you. Don't be moved. Now, if you've been moved in the past, well, today's a new day. We're not going to get moved anymore. We're going to do what the Word says. We're going to conquer everything. And we're going to use our authority and conquer every enemy. We're going to stand up for what the truth is, false doctrines that people speak out there. We're just going to have the truth to speak the Word and bring the truth to them. That's all we can do and pray for them. But make sure you're not making mistakes in your mind or in your mouth or in your heart. Guard yourself. Get established in the truth. You do what you can to help people. Always give them what they have need of, remember, so that then you're going to be above reproach and you're going to be doing everything God wants you to do to help them to come in line and you carry on and you're not going to be, nothing's going to penetrate you. You live that way. You're going to stay at peace and joy all the days of your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation that we must conquer the words of our mouth. Jesus was upholding and bringing into being everything by the spoken word. I am going to speak forth the word. I will make sure I'm not speaking words contrary to the word. I will be slow to speak. I won't be a reactor. I will give the word of God to answer the situations. I will take the covenant in my mouth and speak the promises into being to become a partaker of the divine nature and see the works of God be accomplished in my life. When the word is in my mouth, God will be with my mouth and the Holy Spirit will speak by me when his word is in my tongue. I will speak Right words. I understand. I can't take them back. They've been released. I will make sure that I'm watching the words I speak before God. I will make sure my words are few and they're right words. I thank you that my lips are not my own. I'm bought with a price. I make Jesus Christ Lord over my lips by speaking forth the word of God and only what is right in his sight. I thank you that you're teaching me so I will hold my tongue and I will understand things that I've spoken that were error and I will correct them. I will come to the place as Samuel where none of my words will fall to the ground because I'm speaking right words. I understand death and life are in the power of the tongue. I'm going to speak life. I will not be snared or taken captive with my words. I understand that if I don't bridle my tongue, I will deceive my heart. I'm going to guard my heart and make sure I only speak right words. And now I know the enemy is trying to get to my words that I would speak wrong. I understand that this little member is a world of unrighteousness and it can set on fire that which is evil, but I am not going to give place to speaking what the human nature wants me to speak. God will bring forth His work in my life through the Word in me. And as I obey the Word, yielding my members to only speak in obedience to the Word of God, I will submit to Him 
and I will bring forth righteousness, and I will overcome all attacks of the enemy. Words that I hear, I will not let them move me. If they're words from the enemy, or words that are false, or that are contrary to the truth, just as David did, he was not moved by those negative words. I will not be moved and allow my soul to be vexed. Instead, I will arise and speak the word of God and conquer the enemies as David did. And I will not allow myself to be hurt or wounded through negative words from anybody again. I am guarding myself. I will give people what they have need of. I will speak the truth. I thank you that as I guard myself and only speak right words, I will be in righteousness. And my words won't fall to the ground. And I will see the life of God be manifest. I will make sure that the word is in my mouth and I'm putting my faith in operation because I understand my words are carriers. They are releasers. They're depositing things within me and they're releasing what's in them. I will speak the word as Jesus did and I will bring into being all things according to the word of God by the spoken word of the power of God that's resident in the word. And as I speak your word, I will see your works accomplished. And I will see everything that I speak coming to pass and ministering life. Thank you. My mouth belongs to you. You are Lord over my tongue. I'm only going to speak what is right in your sight from this day forward. Thank you for accomplishing this. For as I am conquering this little member and the words coming out of my mouth, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. You get a hold of this, it's going to turn your whole life around. If you don't get a hold of the tongue, though, you're going to be sowing things negative left and right that aren't good. Blessings coming out, not cursing. Right things we're going to speak. Remember, your mouth is a releaser, and it's setting on course just like the rudder on the ship or the bit in the horse's bridle. It's setting you on the course you're going. You want to stay on the right course. Don't let yourself get off. Speak right words. God will accomplish great things. Of course, how are you going to do it? Because you get the word in you. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I'm not going to speak words that are idle or non-productive because I'm going to be judged for those too. Therefore, I'm going to speak words that are productive, that are in line with the word, that are going to release what God wants in every situation. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of this word. Thank you. We're going to make sure we're speaking right words from this day forward. We praise you for all that you're going to accomplish in bringing this to pass in our life because we're hearers and doers of this word. In Jesus' name.